everybody, Mike Biamonte, FBI School of Operational Medicine again. Uh, hope everybody is well and COVID free. This is video number nine, airway, uh, getting into some of the good stuff now. We discussed patient assessment last video, uh, which is important. It really is, as we discussed. And um, I think it's going to play very nicely into everything else that we have going on. So let's get a couple of things out of the way. Uh, thank you again for watching. Thank you again for your comments. Uh, just been tremendous feedback. I can't thank you enough for that. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, the photos behind me. Yes, I am changing them, uh, especially when presenting to a group of, of investigators. I'm trying to keep your investigative skills honed uh, to see the different pictures behind me. Yeah, it's just, it is what it is. Truth be told, um, uh, our house is on the market, so we were told to take all of our personal photos down. So right now the house is completely bare and naked of, of personal photos on the wall. So I have to go down into the basement, rummage through some photos, and put them back up behind me just to put something up behind me so it looks decent. So yeah, so I'll try and keep it fresh and keep it different. Um, these are the old ones that were up there before, so I'll try and get more creative, but nothing perverted. Let's see. Let's see. Documents. I want to apologize. <coughs> Pardon me. Corona. Uh, last class, uh, last video, I put up a couple of documents, sample, OPQRST, AFPU, those types of things. And I guess I, I overestimated or underestimated the size of the font. Uh, so some of you had a hard time viewing that. And that's my bad. I apologize. Uh, I'm still figuring this thing out and uh, taking all things into consideration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post for the FBI folk. Uh, I'm going to post those documents on uh, the School of Medicine SharePoint site. But I'm also going to post the field guide that I uh, issued to EMRs and EMT refresher uh, students on the SharePoint side as well. So for my FBI folk, if you want to print that um, field guide, laminate it, put a beaner through it, carry it around with you, uh, I, I could care less. As a matter of fact, I encourage it. It's a nice tool to have in your um, kit when you're rolling out the door. Okay, that's the administrative stuff. Nothing classified, nothing sensitive, no endorsements there. Got that out of the way. Nice. And I've got a different color shirt on. Uh, this one's gray versus the black I've been wearing. Uh, i got to get some more exciting shirts. These are the things I have to worry about nowadays. So let me refer to my notes and make sure we're on track here. What we're going to talk about is airway. But the first part of this two-part series in airway, and just, uh, again, for clarification, not every subject has two parts. Somebody had asked me that. Oh, is there a second part to... No, uh, not every video I do has two parts. Just the, the bigger topics tend to have two parts, like airway is going to have two parts. This is part one of two. A lot of people are going to expect in this video, I'm going to be talking about NPAs, OPAs, intubations, superglottic airways, that kind of thing. Nope, we're going to start off with anatomy and physiology, diffusion, osmosis. I know you think I'm a pain in the ass with this stuff, but it's so, so important. It really is. Um... The thing about airway is you, we have to understand why, uh, why someone's having trouble breathing, uh, why things are going wrong with a patient at the cellular level, even at the EMT level, EMR level. We have to understand what's going on inside so that we understand why we're implementing the procedures and the adjuncts and the techniques that we're implementing in order to be beneficial. It just gives us a better understanding all the way around. It's not all about uh, trouble breathing. He's just fantastic. Uh, I love his love his his stuff. Okay, let's start talking about anatomy and physiology. Let's go back to the heart, lungs. We'll work our way into a VLI. We'll work our way down those structures. We'll talk about upper airway anatomy uh, next video when we start to discuss airway adjuncts uh, and procedures and techniques and that sort of thing. So right out of the gate, let's go ahead and put this slide up. This is our cardiovascular system, or strike that, this is our heart, uh, right out of the gate. 
let's go back to where we started on one of the first videos. Um, deoxygenated blood coming into the right side of the heart, uh, being pushed out to the lungs, being oxygenated in the lungs, and then being pushed to the left side of the heart, and then being pushed out to the rest of the body. Simple stuff. But this plays an important role in our understanding of cardiovascular disease and the way patients present when we talk about patient assessment. So if we have somebody complaining of difficulty breathing, as you would expect in a respiratory ailment, it doesn't always have to be a respiratory condition. It could be a cardiac condition. So as an example, if the left side of the heart is failing and not doing its job, it's weakened because of, let's say, a heart attack, as an example, right side of the heart could care less. Right side of the heart is going to continue to push blood into the lungs, but the left side of the heart is going to have trouble getting out of its own way and moving blood out of the lungs. So where those two meet, is going to be down at the alveolar level. And on this slide, we'll see just the basics of the basics, and we'll get a little bit more into the nitty gritty. Down at the alveolar level is where our right side of the heart and left side of the heart meet at these alveolar capillaries. So if the right side continues to push blood into the lungs and the left side just can't get it out of the way fast enough, well, the two are going to converge and meet at this capillary level, at the alveolar level, and have a very high hydrostatic pressure or pressure of water. Remember, capillaries are only one cell thick. The alveoli are only one cell thick. Water is non-compressible, and it's going to follow the path of least resistance. So in this case, or in this scenario, that fluid, being plasma, the fluid, the watery part of blood, going back to one of our first videos, is going to get squeezed through those capillary beds and into the alveoli, filling up the alveoli with fluid, giving somebody a sense of shortness of breath or pulmonary edema if it continues to get worse and worse and worse. So let's go ahead and put up just another picture here of a different example. So as we can see in this diagram, uh, in number six, number one and number six, number one is your right ventricle, number six is your left ventricle. Number one is pushing blood out to the lungs, as we described. In the lungs, we have oxygenation taking place, the alveolar level pushes back in, or the left side kind of pulls it back in um, to the left side of the heart, uh, number six, your left ventricle, and then from there it pushes it out to the rest of the body. So when we talk about patient assessment, and later in videos we start talking about patient assessment in the cardiac world, and we talk about shortness of breath being one of the leading diagnostic signs or symptoms more specifically of somebody having a acute coronary syndrome. This is why. So we'll go for one more picture here. And these are our VLI. This is where all the magic happens. So when we start to talk about diffusion and osmosis, and let me just do a quick, quick reiteration of that. Um, Diffusion is the movement of solute, or stuff, electrolytes, particles, gases, what have you. Osmosis is the movement of water. Now, the driving force behind diffusion and osmosis is the concentration of stuff. Now, yes, diffusion is the movement of stuff. Osmosis is the movement of water. But even the water, all right, osmosis, the movement of water, is dictated by the concentration of stuff. So, diffusion by definition is the movement of solute from an area of higher stuff concentration, or solute concentration, to an area of lower, to balance things out, have that homeostasis. Osmosis is the movement of water from an area of lesser solute concentration, or lesser stuff, to an area of higher stuff. Think of this as Water is trying to hydrate an area that doesn't have a lot of water and balance things out and maintain homeostasis. So those two things are constantly going on at the same time. Here at the alveolar level, we're more interested in this video with the movement of gases. And these two gases specifically that we're going to talk about here in a little bit are going to be oxygen and carbon dioxide. So let me throw this up. Not literally. All right, here we go. Diffusion and osmosis. Same slide we had in one of the prior videos, just to make it clear, just so we understand. Again, diffusion does not need a semi-permeable membrane. Uh, we use the example of flatulence. We use the example of uh, 
uncapping a bottle of perfume and having that those perfume molecules will be politically correct. I'll be politically incorrect later, but for now, we'll say perfume. We unpack that cap off of that bottle, and now the whole room slowly but surely fills up with the smell of this perfume. That's diffusion, as one example. It doesn't need a semi-permeable membrane. Whereas if you were to take a uh, dried up raisin and drop it in a glass of water, over time that raisin is going to start to plump up again, but the content of that raisin is not going to leak outside of the skin of that grape or of that raisin. This is the semi-permeable membrane that osmosis needs to work. If that helps, there were some questions that came up about that and I totally get it. Uh, I'm going through these topics pretty quickly and it's designed again for BLS and ALS providers alike. So hopefully uh, my ALS folk are pulling some of the important stuff out at the ALS level and my BLS folk are pulling some, some of the basic stuff out uh, to make more sense of what we're doing. So let me go ahead and pull this slide down. All right, let me check my notes and see where we are. When we talk about airway structures, again, we're going to talk more about upper airway structures in the next video. But for the lower airway structures, we're talking about those bronchioles and more down at the alveolar level. We're going to spend a lot of time in this video at the alveolar level talking about gas exchange, diffusion, how these gases drive our everyday breathing. And contrary to popular belief, we don't necessarily breathe. Our brain isn't driven by an oxygen concentration, our brain is driven by a carbon dioxide concentration, and we'll discuss that here in a little bit. So throughout this first video and leading into the next video, all I want you to really try to remember uh, from EMR all the way to paramedic is all the scientific stuff that we're talking about is nice, right? It's, it's interesting, I think it is. I mean, maybe I'm a nerd that way, but I hope you find it interesting too. But at the end of the day, our job is easy, and I always hate to say that, because I'm, I'm trying to convince everybody that my career has had meaning over the last 32 years and it hasn't been, oh, well, it's all easy. Mike's just been sloughing off for the last 32 years. No, at the end of the day, we're not concerned when our patient's desperately trying to die on us. Our first thought is, well, I wonder what the diffusion is like at the cellular level. No, that's not what we're thinking. All I'm thinking is, holy shit, I got to get their airway open. I got to get some air into them. I got to keep them breathing. These are the things we're thinking about. So at the end of the day, if your patient is desperately trying to die on you and they're not breathing well, it goes back to ABCs. So is their airway open, yes or no? If it's not, open it. Easy. Right? My airway's fine. Nothing to panic about. If they're not breathing well, assist them in breathing or maybe breathe for them if they're not breathing at all. You'll read in a lot of textbooks of how if somebody is breathing too fast, over 30 times a minute, you can take a BVM and you can bag them down. Good luck. Give it a shot. It's not going to work. What ends up happening if somebody hyperventilates is they pass out. It's kind of nice how that happens. Uh, I got a few stories of how I was called the devil and a few other choice words when I had a, a young uh, lady in front of me. Uh, she was a student. I think she was about 15 years old at the time. And I had a high school aide come with me to take her to the hospital. And she was hyperventilating. She was panicked. She just got into a fight and she was all upset and she was pissed off and she was hyperventilating. So what ends up happening with hyperventilation, we're blowing off too much carbon dioxide and we become hypocarbic, as it's called. And we'll discuss that here in a little bit. The body doesn't like that. Now our pH is getting thrown off. Remember, CO2 is an acid. So now we're becoming alkalotic. We're getting rid of, we're, getting, we're suffering from respiratory alkalosis. Remember, we discussed that. They're going to get numb around their lips. They're going to start to get carpal pedal spasms. And they're going to start freaking out even more. And they're going to breathe even harder. And eventually they're going to pass out and they're going to stop breathing for about 30 seconds, which is normal. pH is going to balance, all right? That CO2 is going to build up again naturally. And then they'll start breathing normally and everybody's happy. It's no big deal. Um, I had the uh, school aide sitting next to me and she was appalled that I wasn't doing anything. I was just sitting there letting this girl hyperventilate. So uh, I was a different person back then. This was when I was working in the New York system. I looked at her, I said, listen, I said, in about two minutes, she's going to stop breathing and she's going to be fine. Well, I guess that came out wrong, you know, in retrospect, you know, it sounded differently in my head. So she looked at me like, oh, oh, I can't believe you just said that. And sure enough, what happened in about a minute, the girl passed out and she stopped breathing. <laughs> so now the, the woman's eyes are about this big around. 
I said, just relax. She'll stop. She'll start breathing here in a minute and she'll be fine. Sure enough, about 30 seconds later, she takes a, <gasps> she takes a big breath and now she's breathing normally and she starts crying and the woman looks at me and says, like, Dios mio, Diablo, she's calling me the devil. And so a little glimpse into my life. Okay. Where were we? I digress. I got off topic on that one. So let's go back to airway and let's go back to what drives us to breathe. When we look here at pressures, atmospheric pressures, um, 760 millimeters of mercury, 14.7 psi, uh, however you want to look at it, it's the environment around us that allows air to come into our lungs and allows us to push air out of our lungs. We're not going to get into high altitude pulmonary edema or altitude sickness in this video, but that the understanding of the environment and the understanding of um, atmospheric pressure is going to give us a better understanding of tension pneumothoraxes, altitude sickness, and that sort of thing. Uh, so let's look, uh, take a quick look here. What we have here is just a quick diagram of what our lungs, just a, a picture diagram of our lungs. Breathing in, breathing out. Main muscle of ventilation is your diaphragm. Now, let's just discuss very quickly the difference in semantics between respiration and ventilation. Ventilation is the physical movement of air, the mechanical movement of air in and out of our lungs. So the big topic nowadays in the news are ventilators. And there's not enough ventilators, not enough ventilators. A ventilator is nothing more than a machine that pushes air in and out and takes air out of your lungs. That's it. There are very, very basic ventilators on the market uh, that you'll see in the pre-hospital setting. And there's also extremely fancy ones that you'll see in your ICUs and your CCUs. At the end of the day, whoop, hold on one second, everybody. Let me do this. Thank you. You're the best. <laughs> we have a Roomba. All right, one of the, oh, 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 is it a Roomba? Yeah, it's a Roomba, not a Roomba. Roomba, I Roomba. Call me a hopeless romantic. Uh, one of our uh, anniversaries a few years ago, we got each other this Roomba. So it'll turn on, it'll vacuum the floor and... Best thing ever. All right, I didn't get her a toaster. Uh, I got the, the two of us, we got each other this Roomba. So she ran in to turn it off as it turned on. So anyway, I digress. Let's go back to pressures. Atmospheric pressure. And understanding um, uh, uh, tension pneumothoraxes and high altitude sickness and that sort of thing. So when we take a deep breath in, Let's go ahead and start there. And our, and our ventilation versus respiration, that's where I left off. I'm sorry, let me get my head straight again. Um, ventilation is that physical movement in and out. The, uh, respiration is cellular gas exchange. So when we talk about O2 and CO2 movement, diffusion of those gases going back and forth, we're talking more about cellular respiration, whereas ventilation is that physical movement in and out. So back to the slide. When we take a deep breath in, what we're actually doing is our diaphragm is contracting and pulling down. And what that does to the interthoracic cavity is it lowers interthoracic pressure. And when I say it lowers it, it lowers it in comparison to atmospheric pressure. So let's just use 14.7 PSI as an example. Don't take these numbers to the bank. These are generalizations. But if 14.7 PSI is normal, in order for us to allow the atmosphere, 14.7 PSI, to come into my chest, into my interthoracic cavity, where my lungs sit, not inside my lungs necessarily, but in the space around my lungs, um, we have to lower our interthoracic pressure. So by taking that deep breath in, by having our diaphragm contract and pull down and and taking that big breath in, we're lowering interthoracic pressure to say maybe 14.5, who knows, give or take. This allows 14.7 to push into our mouth and nose, down into our lungs, life is good. This is a process that requires energy, it requires effort, it requires us to physically do this. Exhalation, on the other hand, is passive. So now what ends up happening is the diaphragm relaxes and kind of pushes upward and creates a positive interthoracic pressure, positive compared to that of the atmosphere. So now our interthoracic pressure is say 14.9 compared to atmospheric pressure of 14.7, which allows us to exhale, 
which is why when people die, they give you what's very uh, cleverly uh, called the death breath. I cannot tell you how many patients I've had lie in front of me, and this is uh, no indicator of what kind of a provider I am. I like to think I'm a fairly good provider. But if they're laying in front of you and all of a sudden they give you the, ugh, and you look over at them, it's like, shit. Chances are they just died. They've given you the death breath. All the muscles of their body have relaxed, including the diaphragm. And the last thing they do is push the air out of their lungs, and it gives you that death rattle or that, that very stereotypical death breath. So let me put another slide up here. This is just giving you another example of what we just talked about. We talked about inhalation versus exhalation. Um, that diaphragm contracting down versus that diaphragm passively moving up. Positive intrathoracic pressure versus negative intrathoracic pressure. So again, your thorax or your rib cage is what we consider to be the thoracic cavity. Whereas when we talk about intrapulmonic pressure, we're talking about the pressure inside the lung itself, inside the bronchioles, inside the alveoli, things of that nature. So they are two different animals. So when we start to talk about tension pneumothoraxes in later videos during trauma and chest trauma, we're going to talk about atmospheric pressure versus interthoracic pressure versus interpulmonic pressure, different animals all the way around. And that's what's going to guide a lot of our, a lot of our treatment. Okay, let me pull this slide down. All right, let's see what we have here. I'll make sure I stay on track We we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about that. One of the things down at the VLR level that is uh, not discussed very often is called surfactant. Uh, surfactant is a fluid, essentially, that lowers the surface tension of water at the VLR level. I really don't even know what that means, quite frankly, but that's the definition of it. All I know is that surfactant is necessary to maintain the patency of the VLI. So think of the VLI as a balloon. Right? You blow up a balloon, nice little round doohickey. That's your VLI. That's the position and that's the shape you want it. You want it to maintain that, that patency, or that open nature. So you can breathe in, breathe out, gas exchange, so on and so on. Surfactant is one of the last things that's uh, created, for lack of a better word, um, before we're born. So this is why uh, babies who are born prematurely, before that 40 week or that 37 week mark, anything before that, and they end up having uh, pulmonary issues because the lungs haven't fully developed and there's not enough surfactant in the alveoli to keep the alveoli open. And they suffer from a condition known as what's called atelectasis. Atelectasis is when your alveoli collapse. Atelectasis can be caused by certain types of drowning, uh, different disease processes, and newborns. So in newborns, if they have a lack of surfactant, their alveoli aren't able to open and thereby they cannot ventilate and oxygenate properly. So what they do at the neonatal level, and this is way above my pay grade, is they'll actually take and they'll inject surfactant, I guess a chemically altered, I'm not 100% sure, so don't, don't quote me on that, uh, whether it's natural or it's a chemically altered type of surfactant, they'll inject it into the baby's lungs to keep their VLI open, which is pretty cool. But atelectasis is that name of a VLI that are actually collapsed down. Um, so when we talk about compliance and bagging somebody, we'll get into that in the next video of a patient assessment and bagging somebody, but I'm a huge fan of feeling the compliance in a BVM when you're manually bagging somebody or ventilating for somebody, you should have good compliance. It should be nice and easy. You should see that chest rise and fall. As long as you have an open airway with an NPA, OPA, superglottic or entitled uh, endotracheal intubation, it, the bagging should be easy. But as you start to fill up the lungs with fluids or you have a tension pneumothorax or whatever, you're going to feel a resistance in that bag. And that's a reduced compliance. Uh, so if we have a reduced compliance and somebody will tell you, say to you, hey, it's getting tough to bag, something's going on in the interpulmonic space or the interthoracic space that's creating more pressure. And atelectasis can sometimes do that. Fluid in the lungs can do that. Tension pneumothorax can do that. So don't take it lightly. If all of a sudden you can't bag somebody, and we're going to talk about a mnemonic called DOPE uh, later on, dislodgement, obstruction, pneumothorax equipment. And if you're having trouble with bagging somebody and that compliance is going down, something's wrong. And, and let your partner know about it so you can start troubleshooting it.
Let's see. Let's talk about lung volumes and capacity. Uh, a lot of technical terms here, but we'll keep it simple. Let's look at this slide. A lot of real fancy terms here. We talk about inspiratory reserve volume and inspiratory capacity and resting tidal volume. Holy cow. We're not here to make you respiratory therapists. Uh, we're not here to make you uh, gas passers. That's not what we're here to do. Let's keep it simple. In all the years that I've been a paramedic, I've used one term, maybe, and that's tidal volume. How's their tidal volume? What's their tidal volume? So the amount of air they take in is and get rid of. That's some of their tidal volume. So as a general rule, what we're looking at here uh, for tidal volume, again, these are rough numbers, about 500 to 600 cc's or 500 to 600 milliliters. Don't quote me on this, but the average BVM, I think, is about 800 cc's. So if you need to compress that entire bag in order to get full volume into your adult, then the answer is really no. You don't have to wring out every single you know, cubic centimeter of air in that bag to ventilate somebody. All you're looking for is rise and fall of the chest. That's it. As long as you have good rise and fall of the chest, you have adequate tidal volume. About 150 cc's of that air that you're pushing in actually resides in an area called your anatomical dead space. So the area from the tip of your nose and mouth to uh, where your carina is. Your carina is where your trachea bifurcates into your left and right main stem bronchus and down into your bronchioles. Even the air in your bronchioles is considered to be dead space. The only air that really matters is the air that gets down into your alveoli, because that's where gas exchange takes place. I can put all the air in the, in the world into my trachea, my bronchioles, uh, means nothing because there's no gas exchange taking place. I have to get that air down to the alveolar level. So anywhere between the top of the alveolar, maybe your alveolar ducts, your respiratory ducts, uh, up to the, my nose and mouth, that's anatomical dead space. And that's give or take about 150 cc's of air. Um, so total tidal volume, 500 to 600, more or less. We're not here to make you critical care medics and start going through, you know, expiratory reserve volume and functional residual. But don't worry about that. I'm not even concerned, concerned about total lung capacity, tidal volume. And the best way for us to tell that we're giving somebody adequate tidal volume is adequate rise and fall of the chest. That's what we're looking for. That's it in a nutshell. Let's see, uh, minute volume by definition, tidal volume, time for respiratory rate, and that's great. How in the hell are you gonna know that in the field? You have no idea, right? It's just a term that's thrown out there by respiratory therapists, and these are very relevant terms. In the critical care world, if, uh, for my ALS providers, if you're receiving a patient uh, and you have to put them on your vent, you want to know your, uh, your inspiratory volume, your expiratory volume, your peak pressures, your PEEP, your, uh, your tidal volume. You want to know all those numbers to plug into your machine at the basic level and even at the paramedic level without a, uh, a ventilator. We don't care. All we want is good rise and fall of the chest. That's it. That's all we're looking for. All right. Let me pull this slide down. Let's continue on and uh, let's talk about gas for a second. What the hell is his problem? I don't know. He's acting worse than you do when you're trying to cover your farts by coughing. Okay, welcome to the PTA meeting. On the subject of school lunches, I know there's been some concern about nutrition. <coughs> uh, we've had complaints about the soda machines. <coughs> and I have spoken with the school board. <coughs> is there something you'd like to say, Mr. Griffin? Uh, no. No. No, I'm good. <coughs> Again, you know how much I love Peter. I'm a big kid. Uh, we're not going to talk about that kind of gas. It's a different kind of gas altogether. Let's talk about oxygen and CO2. Before, I alluded to the fact that it's CO2 that really drives us to breathe, which rubs some people the wrong way. Uh, some people would think, well, we need oxygen to survive. Well, it's true. There's 21% oxygen in the air. About 78% of the air is nitrogen. Less than 2% of atmosphere, I'm sorry, less than 1% of atmospheric air is carbon dioxide. But it's carbon dioxide that drives us to breathe at the, at the, at the brainstem and the medulla. 
Now I'll put a picture up here in a little bit. We'll talk about nervous system control of, of our breathing. But it's carbon dioxide that drives us to breathe. Remember we talked about chemoreceptors earlier, and we talked about how slight fluctuations in our pH, 7.35 to 7.45, that minor alteration is going to drive us to either breathe faster or slow down and not breathe at all. Hence my uh, young girl laying in front of me who hyperventilated, she was blowing off all of her acid. She was becoming more alkalotic. Her pH was going up beyond 7.45, let's say. So what did the body do? Shut her down, hit the reboot button. She stopped breathing. Well now, our pH is coming back to normal because we're retaining these acids. And now the brainstem tells the body, or the body, the chemoreceptors more specifically in the body, tell the brainstem, okay, we're where we want to be right now, start breathing again. They start breathing again, they start crying, you get called the devil, and all is right with the world. Uh, that's soup to nuts. If we are not breathing at all, let's say an opioid overdose, where we're guppy breathing, uh, where we're only breathing maybe four times a minute, and we get that snoreness, unconscious breathing, bradypnea, breathing only about four times a minute, give or take. Well, these people are retaining too much carbon dioxide. They're retaining too much acid. Their pH is starting to drop. They're becoming more acidic. They're suffering from respiratory acidosis. Easy fix. Mother Nature isn't going to shut them down. In the perfect world, Mother Nature is going to tell them to breathe faster, but they've got these drugs on board that are going to prevent that. We come along with an NPA and a BVM, we bag that patient up, and we're blowing that CO2 off for them. Granted, your opioid overdose is not going to wake up when we do this because they're under the influence of those heavy opioids. So until we give Narcan, they're going to remain unconscious. But that's okay. I don't want to talk to these people anyway. Right? There's nothing that they can tell me that I want to hear at this point. I pretty much have an idea as to what's wrong with them. And I hate to sound callous, but care less. My job is to keep them alive. That's my job. So, how would I keep an opioid overdose alive? Drop a nose hose in them, all right, an NPA, we'll talk about those next video, and bag them. All right, how often am I going to bag them? About 10 to, 10 to 20 times, 10 to 16 times a minute, give or take. Once every six seconds. That's it. Good rise and fall of the chest. It's all we want to do. Nice and easy. And we'll talk about respiratory rates, or rather ventilatory rates and, and procedures in the next video. So what we're looking to do is we're looking to manage that CO2 level, whether we know it or not. Now, at the advanced level, we have entitled CO2 detectors, uh, normal range 35 to 45, and we'll play games uh, with, not uh, literal games, but we'll play games with those levels uh, based on how our patient presents. In the cardiac arrest scenario, when we find somebody stone dead, we intubate them and we put entitled CO2 on, we're looking to see how effective our chest compressions are. Uh, and as per the American Heart Association, if we can't get our entitled CO2 above 10 millimeters of mercury, even after a couple of minutes of good quality CPR, mm, chances of them surviving is about zero. And that's going to dictate our decision-making process as to whether we leave this patient, call them, you know, pronounce them dead, or transport them. Now, in the COVID-19 arena, that's a whole new protocol now. We're not even going to get into that. Uh, but our entitled CO2 becomes important in our patient management. Uh, we'll also see how entitled CO2 becomes important with head injury and head bleeds, and how in certain circumstances, may we, may we, we may want to bag a little faster and blow off some of that entitled and keep their entitled CO2 at about 30 to promote cerebral vasoconstriction to maybe slow down some of the bleeding in the brain. Again, these are topics we'll talk about later on. So let me get back on track here. Let's see, let's see, let's see. So in, in your COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, we'll talk more about that in the respiratory video, but they walk around, they walk around, wow, I sound like uh, Elma Fudd, they walk around, or Kripke from Big Bang, anybody watch Big Bang? I like that show. Um, they walk around in a perpetual state of what we call hypercarbia, where their uh, entitled CO2 is always very high because the COPDers, they have a hard time getting rid of carbon dioxide because they have what's called air trapping at the alveolar level, and these are things we'll talk about later. 
but they're walking around in a perpetual state of respiratory acidosis. They're always very high. So the brain over time starts to change gears and it relies on what's called a hypoxic drive. Uh, it doesn't rely on carbon dioxide anymore. It relies on oxygen to breathe. So where you and I, uh, not to say normal people, that's the wrong way to say it, people without COPD breathe on a carbon dioxide level. If our carbon dioxide level gets too high, we breathe faster. If our carbon dioxide level gets too low, well, our breathing slows down. In COPDers, uh, severe COPDers, uh, they rely on what's called a hypoxic drive, and they rely on an oxygen concentration to breathe. So as an example, if their oxygen level is too low, they will breathe faster to get more oxygen in. However, if their oxygen level is too high, and the chemoreceptors in the body sense this, it tells the body to stop breathing, which is why years ago we were taught never, never, never give a COPD or 100% O2 because you're going to kill them. Theoretically, that's correct. Theoretically, if you give a COPD or 100% O2 for too long a period of time, what does their body say? Hey, you got way too much oxygen. Stop breathing and they'll die. Now, they have to be on 100% O2 for a good amount of time for this to happen. But suffice it to say, that was what we were once taught years ago. Nowadays, we don't think that way. In the pre-hospital environment, we don't think that way. If we have somebody who's complaining of trouble breathing, regardless as to whether they're a COPD or not, they get 100% O2 because we're not going to kick their hypoxic drive in until hours later. So we'll get more into that later on. Uh, let's look and make sure I'm on track here. All right, we talked about that. We talked about that. Good, good, good. Let's talk about that little component in our blood. Let me show you this slide. Our red blood cell. The red blood cell is what carries oxygen and carbon dioxide around our body. Uh, that is the workhorse of our, of our life. So in trauma, if we're bleeding out and we're leaving our red blood cells on the sidewalk or wherever, well, then that's not available to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide around our body. Hemoglobin in, or rather, red blood cells, uh, it's the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell, that protein, that actually allows oxygen to bind to it to be carried from point A to point B. Plasma plays a huge role in this, and we're not gonna get into all of the different uh, idiosyncrasies of oxygen and carbon dioxide transport. But at the basic level, let's just understand that it's the red blood cell that is carrying that oxygen from point A to point B. If we become hypothermic, oxygen cannot bind to hemoglobin as well as it should. If we become uh, acidotic, Oxygen cannot bind to hemoglobin the way it's supposed to, thereby making us suffer from hypoperfusion and, and just aggravating our condition. Other conditions, um, hypoxia, right? low oxygen content in blood, uh, hypercarbia, uh, high CO2 levels in blood, hypocarbia, low CO2 levels in the blood. So it's all about oxygen and carbon dioxide at that red blood cell level that keeps us alive. So just, I just wanted to, uh, just to touch on that real quick. And false positives. Uh, although your entitled, I'm sorry, your SpO2 um, detectors, your finger probes, what have you, are great tools in patient care in a pre-hospital environment. They're a toy. They're a tool. Uh, they are something that should confirm what you already suspect. If you think your patient is hypoxic, well, give them oxygen if you have it. Don't rely wholeheartedly on your SpO2 detector. Because as an example, let's say somebody is suffering from CO poisoning or carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, they were pulled out of a structure fire or they tried to kill themselves in a garage with a car running or they were in a house that had a boiler puff back, uh, depending on what part of the country uh, you live in. These patients may be suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide has an affinity in a, or, an attractive, or an attraction to red blood cells 200 times greater than that of oxygen. So with that being said, if somebody is suffering from CO poisoning, carbon monoxide comes along and bumps O2 off of a red blood cell and occupies the receptor sites on that protein of hemoglobin on that red blood cell, thereby making your patient hypoxic, although 
they're breathing plenty of oxygen, let's say, or you're giving them oxygen, whatever, uh, which, gives, which is gonna give you a false positive in your SpO2 detector, because what your SpO2 detector reads is the color of your hemoglobin. If our hemoglobin, our red blood cell, is fully saturated, it's gonna be a brighter red. Now notice I didn't say fully saturated with oxygen. As long as your hemoglobin has four, it has its four uh, sites occupied, it's gonna change color. It's gonna be a different color. And that's what your SpO2 detector is going to sense. So if it's fully occupied with carbon monoxide, well, it's gonna read 100% saturated, although your patient is suffering from hypoxia. So I say this just to make you understand that although we have some pretty fantastic tools and diagnostic tools pre-hospitally, uh, look at your patient, treat your patient, not the machine. If your patient looks sick, I don't give a crap what that SpO2 monitor says, go ahead and give them oxygen. Uh, That's just from me to you. Let me pull that slide down. And let's get into our last piece of this and talk about nervous control or our nervous system control of breathing and, and how that affects us. There's apneustic centers, there's pneumotaxic centers, inspiratory centers, expiratory centers, all within the medulla and the pons. It's just fantastic. I love this shit. Uh, it's just wild, wild stuff as to how we breathe. So as an example, if I tried to, if I wanted another glass of Jack Daniels and my wife says, no, you've had enough. And I cross my arms and I say, oh, and I'm going to hold my breath until I get another glass of Jack Daniels. Well, what's going to happen? So I'm holding my breath. Now what's building up in my system? Carbon dioxide. Well, eventually the body is going to become hypercarbic. And those chemoreceptors are going to tell the brain, hey, stupid, your pH is starting to drop. You're becoming acidic. You need to breathe again. And over a certain amount of time, your body is going to force you to take a breath, whether you want to or not. And you're going <gasps> to... Oh. Right? So my kids can't hold their breath until they, until they die. Uh, if we go under water, we can't hold our breath for so long until we have to take a breath and then we, we drown. So let me go ahead and put this slide up here real quick. What we're looking at here is the midbrain, uh, the medulla, the medulla oblongata, the pons area of the brain. Pons in Latin means bridge. And it's that, that bridge between uh, your midbrain and your, your larger brain. But within this area, here's where we have our pneumotaxic centers, our apneustic centers, our inspiratory, expiratory centers. These are the main areas of the brain that drive ventilation, that keep us breathing. So when our chemoreceptors in our body sense pH changes, well, this is the area that it sends signals to to tell us to breathe. Under normal circumstances, our inspiratory, expiratory uh, centers of our medulla, of our brain, are in full control and they're allowing us to breathe in, exhale, breathe in, exhale as I sit here right now, totally normal, not under any distress, uh, not physically active. This is what's happening. Within our lungs, uh, we have what are called, uh, we have um, nerve fibers or sensors and it triggers what's called our Herring-Brower reflex. So for me to take a deep breath in, the inspiratory centers of my brain and the stretch receptors of my lungs are going to eventually stop me from breathing in too much and popping my lungs. This is called a Herring-Brower reflex. It's a vagal response. And it stops me from breathing in too much and popping my own lungs, which is kind of cool. Expiratory centers are fairly benign. It's passive. It just allows us to exhale. Under periods of stress, our pneumotaxic center will try and slow us down. So if we go for a run, we get scared, uh, we're under a lot of stress, whatever, and we're starting to breathe fast, tachypnea, the pneumotaxic centers of our brain will kick in and try to slow us down. Whereas just the opposite, our apneustic centers of our brain will try to speed us up if we are stressed out, scared, uh, under stress, whatever. Again, that and $2 will get you a cup of coffee. But that's how our brain stem works. That's how important our brain stem is to our everyday uh, ventilatory effort and respiratory effort for that, uh, for, uh, on that line of thought. Two other structures that I, I find pretty cool 
are what are called phrenic nerves. Our phrenic nerves are two nerves that go from around uh, the C3, the cervical, uh, cervical spine. Let me pull this slide down. So these phrenic nerves are nerves that go from around C3, C4, cervical spine, or cervical vertebra 3 or 4. They're two wires, essentially, that go from high in your cervical spine down to your diaphragm and plug in. And if you, uh, during, um, uh, during an autopsy, during gross anatomy labs, I always love to point these out to the students when we have the opportunity, if they're still intact, they look like two banjo strings that are coming from high in the neck all the way down, they plug into the top of your diaphragm. It's these nerves that transmit the impulse from your midbrain, from your brain stem, down to your diaphragm, telling your diaphragm to contract, relax, contract, relax. It also has some effect, not your phrenic nerves, but your brainstem on your intercostal muscles and your what are called accessory muscles to help you breathe faster. Um, but under normal circumstances, we don't use accessory muscles. Our sternocleidomastoids, our intercostals, our scalenous muscles, all the other muscles that help us breathe, those are only under extreme conditions or distress or physical exertion. As I sit here right now, you can't see me breathing. Right? You shouldn't. So I'm not in distress, but our phrenic nerves are the two wires that carry the impulse from our midbrain down to our diaphragm, telling it to contract and relax. This is why if we have high cervical fractures, and I'll use Christopher Reeves as an example, uh, was thrown from his horse, hit his head, fractured high in the cervical spine. Now the signal that's supposed to go from midbrain down to the diaphragm isn't transmitted. Uh, not to say that those phrenic nerves are lacerated, but the signal isn't going down because of that. The, the, uh, the, the spinal column, the spinal cord was cut higher than that phrenic nerve area. And now those signals can't be transmitted to the diaphragm. Now our patient can't breathe. So when we have somebody with high cervical fractures and they have an inability to breathe, that's why the impulse cannot be transmitted down those phrenic nerves, which is pretty wild. All right, let's see. Let's make sure I'm on track here. I think we're good. I think we've covered everything I want to cover today. We're at the 45 minute mark, so we're right on target. Let's see. That should be it for the day. A lot of information, a lot of cool information. This is going to lead us into our next video when we start to talk about adjuncts and breathing for somebody and looking at the assessment of somebody in respiratory distress, why they might be in distress and what, why and what. What's going on with my patient? Why is it happening? And what can I do about it? And we'll get more into adjuncts and, and tools and techniques in the next video. Enjoying it. Having a great time. Um, a lot of people have asked me within the Bureau. Uh, I don't know how this would work outside the Bureau. But a lot of people have asked me internally, hey, what can we do? Thank you for the videos. And I'm not in this for the thanks. Trust me. But everybody, especially within the Bureau and even outside the Bureau, you understand how the how the, the big wheel turns. If my bosses don't know that I'm doing a good job, well, then I don't get funding and it's harder for me to do my job for you. And so help me help you. If you have the time and you're so inclined and you want to send a nice email uh, up your chain of command so that it gets to my chain of command, so that it comes down to me and my administration knows that I'm doing a good job, that would go a long way. That helps me a lot in uh, maintaining the schoolhouse and maintaining uh, some forward momentum. So if you're so inclined and you'd like to, thank you so much. I'd appreciate it. Don't send the bad ones. I don't want to, don't, don't, the, the bad ones don't have to go there. Just, just the good ones. That's all we need to talk about. Okay. So for my uh, bureau folk, let's see the code word, super secret code word for this, uh, uh, this video is watch. Uh, uh, standing watch or a uh, uh, watch. Uh, any old kind of watch. Uh, you've been pretty creative in, in putting those into your sentences. So that's going to be the code word for this video. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Having a great time. Stay well. Stay COVID free. And I'll, uh, I'll change the pictures up next time and try to put something a little, a little nicer. All right, gang. Have a great day. Be safe. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.